good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, our seminar today. My name is Johannes Urplein, and I'm the director of the Energy Resources and Environment Program here at SAIS. Uh, and today, uh, it is a great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Nate Hopman uh, to our seminar. He's a professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, he's a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution, and uh, I think most interestingly, the director of the Center for Global Sustainability, which is doing some really exciting work uh, on, on a number of issues related to climate policy, uh, clean energy, and sustainability more broadly. And today, uh, we're going to hear about America's uh, pledge and beyond, uh, harnessing state, city, and business these actions to raise climate ambition globally. So we'll uh, follow our usual uh, playbook. So Ned is going to give his talk, and then I'm going to uh, ask one or two questions to open the discussion. And then after that, uh, I expect to hear from everybody around the table. All right, Ned, all yours. Good afternoon, everybody. And I'm going to stand, because I noticed everybody sat on that side of the table, on the back half of the table. So it's sorry you can, you can all see me. Um, Thanks, Johannes, for the nice introduction and also for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, we're all in the same, we're all in the same uh, city, this whole that metro area. I'm just in the University of Maryland. You may not have even been out there, but it's in, it's on the Washington Beltway. It's actually not that far. Uh, you can get there very easily. So I hope uh, at some point, if we have talks uh, out there, you guys are all, of course, welcome to come out, other events, et cetera. So I'm um, happy to be uh, kind of uh, yeah, able to come here and, and share a little bit of what what I've been working on, what we've been working on out at the out at the center and at the School of Public Policy with with what you guys are uh, hopefully interested in. Um, so my talk today um, has three major points. The first major point is we all know that there's a lot of city, state, business, other actor action on climate change. In other words, action that's not happening from just the nation state, but it's happening at different and diverse levels of government and also in other kinds of organizations. We've all heard about it, we've all seen it. The first part of my talk, in fact, the bulk of my talk, because that's what a lot of the research is, doing, is about uh, the significant, the, the, the important and essential question of what does that all add all up to? So like, you know, there's all this stuff, but what, what can it really do? Does it actually make a difference? And saying basically the point is that in the United States it does in fact make a significant contribution. So that's the first point. The second point is how those city state business and other organizations' actions actually lay the groundwork what I, for what I call a comprehensive federal strategy, a comprehensive, I should call it, American strategy um, to engage with climate change. And I was just uh, a couple of days ago had the opportunity to go testify to the House of Representatives, which has a subcommittee that was interested in this. And of course, I very much wanted to frame this as a comprehensive American strategy and not just something that is city, states, and businesses carrying all the burden that frankly has to be shared across all governance levels in our country. And the third thing I'm going to talk about, which I'd like us maybe, you know, this might be something, a point of departure for our conversation, is to think about how the fusing of subnational ambition, or the, 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 the subnational ambition itself can fuse with national level ambition as we're looking toward the next two year period, notably the Secretary General Summit in 2019, notably the next COP, which would likely be in January of next year, and of course running into this next cycle of the Paris Agreement, which is embedded in our kind of overall international global approach to climate, but which is predicated on a continuous increase of ambition during every five-year cycle. So how does this subnational ambition sort of fuse with that, and how does it frankly enter into the uh, approach that we're using as an international community? So that's that's the thesis. Okay. So let's start out with the, the some of the some of the, the substance here. Um, as I mentioned. Uh, We've all heard about all this kind of groundswell of action happening in the United States and elsewhere. Um, many of you are aware that our president, Donald J. Trump, announced in June of 20, uh, a year and a half, June 2017, his, his intent to pull out, pull the United States out of the Paris Agreement. And within 72 hours, there was a rapidly organized coalition of city, states, and businesses which is now called We Are Still In, that came together and said, we are still in for the goals of the Paris Agreement. Okay. There are other coalitions that have kind of been emergent and others that have been around for, in some ways, many more years, 
There's mayors in cities, this is just one example. Um, and then there's this US Climate Alliance, which is an alliance of states in the United States, which is now, does everybody know how many? 22 states um, uh, strong uh, and uh, representing a good chunk of the US economy and population. Now, these coalitions are overlapping. There's not, not there's kind of, it's, it's, there's no kind of systematic approach to this. Uh, what we did, this is one of the, the, the maps that we put together, just showing the kind of geographical diversity and some of the institutional diversity of those uh, of those coalitions. Right now, there's well over 3,600 city, states, businesses, communities of faith, tribal groups, counties, uh, who else? Uh, healthcare organizations, uh, cultural institutions like museums. Okay, so they're all. Was that universities. universities? Thank you very much, including our own University of Maryland. Is in that? Thank you. I, I don't know about yours, but hopefully. Um, who, are, who have said we are still sort of working on, we're thinking about, we're supporting the goals of Paris in in certain specific ways, not prescribed by the coalitions, but are kind of self-generated. Um, so there are a lot. So what? Um, the first question is, you know, what is what kind of institutional habit do those organizations have? And the answer is that that coalition is, those coalitions are globally significant. Um, were they a country, which is an exercise California likes to play, were, it, were they a country, um, they would constitute the world's third largest economy and the world's fourth largest greenhouse gas emitter. So they represent over half of the US population, 173 million people, um, and nearly 60% of US GDP. So they are globally significant. They do matter, potentially, right? But we're all in a, you know, a, we, we all care about sort of policy and policy assessment and the impacts of policy. And so it's great to know that they have a large amount of health, but the, the real question is what is it? What does it then add up to? And now I'm giving you my final result. So the rest of the talk you can just leave if you want. This is basically it. Um, the answer is that it does add up to something. And even with the city, state, and business action, as they've sort of committed to already, and by already I mean as of last summer, which is when we locked in the, the data for the study, um, those city, state, and business actions drive US emissions down to something like 17% below 2005 levels by 2025. Um, some of you might know uh, that our US target, our nationally determined contribution, is actually 26 to 28% below 2005 levels by 2025. So what that tells you, of course, is that city, state, and business actions, as they were currently committed to this past summer, not sufficient to get to the target. Um, but I'm also gonna discuss how, with some near-term high impact and politically plausible and realistic actions, you can get to either 21 or 24% below 2005 levels with just city, state, and business action. Okay, so it's not high in the sky, it's reasonable, it's realistic, and it's sort of in line with the recent trends we've seen after the midterm elections. Now, I have to say, I, I work in the White House on our NDC. I was, you know, I put the spreadsheet together that was the NDC uh, uh, spreadsheet, and I have to say, 26% was always gonna be really hard. It was always gonna be really hard. So I think it's really important to note, and it's actually kind of a surprising result in some ways, that. The actions that we you know, look at from the city, states, and business, the fact that they can get us to 24 is a, is a significant result. It's a lot of reduction that we can get in our US federal system from actions that are diversified and not all done from the federal level. So let's talk about what that, what that really means. Um, in order to do this project, we worked with this group called America's Pledge that arose out of the We Are Still In Coalition. It was co-chaired by Michael Bloomberg and Jerry Brown. Um, and I should note that Bloomberg Philanthropies funded this project, so there is a Bloomberg link there. Um, and what their vision was, was to do precisely this, was to say, look, how does, how, we, we all are happy, everybody knows Michael Bloomberg's former mayor of New York, they're interested in cities, Jerry Brown, of course, interested in state contributions. And so they wanted to kind of better understand what the potential was for this action to happen uh, in the United States. And this is from the, um, Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco, which is where we released the report. Um, so let me talk about, I don't know really your community that well. Um, I have a lot of semi-technical slides in here, but I also want to kind of talk, I also want to kind of mention, look, I might just kind of skirt a little bit quickly through this stuff, and if you're interested, raise your hand and interrupt me, or we talk in Q&A. 
or you're also very welcome to read any part of the 88-page technical appendix, which is available online, which is very detailed and probably more detailed than anybody in here really wants to go through, but it's all there. Um, before I go in, I just want to say like that there were a lot of co-authors on this work. There's a lot of institutions. We at the University of Maryland sort of co-led the research uh, part of America's Lab with the Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, for the report itself, I was a lead author with another guy, Colby Calhoun. Uh, and then we have a number of contributing authors across seven different institutions, something like 55, uh, plus a technical modeling team that I don't formally include because they are in the Department of Energy. So we don't put their names. Um, reasons that you can think about. Um, the approach that we took to this, and I, I don't know, again, it, you know, some of you in here might be interested in the aggregation strategy. Um, let me kind of make it sort of a little bit more broad brush and atmospheric. Uh, we have a sort of multi-stage approach to this. Um, when you're looking at city, state, and business actions, as anybody who's worked with data might be able to imagine, the data are very messy. They're very ragged. There's different kinds of targets. There's different kinds of reporting. There's different kinds of you know, timelines and, 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 and timetables that different entities use. So all that has to be kind of collapsed into something that's reasonably consistent. Um, so the first step that we do is we do get some, some data from a few of our data providers, including CDP, if people know, know them. Um, and we use that to kind of construct this footprint. That's the thing that I mentioned before about the world's third largest economy and fourth largest greenhouse gas emitter. Um, we then feed that into uh, a, a essentially a spreadsheet modeling or aggregation tool that uh, the World Resources Institute, one of our partners, developed for this project called Athena. We can go into Athena more if people are interested. But just to kind of the broad brush of that is that Athena takes all those city, state, and business promises and policies and puts it into some terms like how many terawatt hours of renewable electricity do we expect in different parts of the country from each of these strategies. So that's just one example. And then finally, um, although there's a double arrow here, which I'll explain in a minute, we actually, in order to get an economy-wide assessment of impact, that's kind of part of the challenge of these things. Because you can always like tabulate up, well, you know, uh, Portland is going to reduce by 30% by 2040, and the state of California is going to reduce by X percent by 2040, whatever it is now. Um, and you can sort of tot it up and sort of say, here's what the goals are. But it's actually very hard to assess, based on all the goals and these kind of ragged data sets, what the actual aggregated outcome is, unless you run it through an economy-wide model. And so that's what we use this one called GCAM USA. That's the Global Change Assessment Model for the United States, which Way has worked on. Not the USA one, but the but Have you worked on USA? OK. So, um, uh, so you aggregate all of the inputs through GCAM, and GCAM is an integrated assessment model, which is designed to do both kind of integrated climate and energy economic assessment. It's one of the big sort of five or six integrated assessment models globally, usually used as an input for things like IPCC scenarios, but also there's a special US version, which is a 50 state model that we can use to assess the impact of all of these different kinds of policies and targets for the United States. And it accounts for all the kind of cross uh, pressures that happen when you push on one part of the economy and it pulls on another. And so, for example, you know, if you if you imagine we had a big biofuels policy, well, that you know might displace some some emissions from fossil fuels, but it might also change things in land use. And it's unless you have an integrated model, you can't really tell what the net emissions outcome of something like that is. Uh, but GCAM is one of the ways that we can a tool of the, the style of tool that we can use to, to, to get it back to the question. And that's probably, honestly, enough on it. I'm not, not going to really do much more on that, because I think we have better things to talk about. But I'm happy to come, go, come back to this if, if, if people want. The one thing that, so skip all this arrow stuff. Um, we can come back to this if people are interested. One thing I do want to highlight, is very small text, probably not a good slide structure for me, but um, the one thing we did do then is to construct, of course, for those of you who do modeling and projections, you know this is an important step, is to think about, okay, we have our toolkit, we have our analytical strategy set up, but what is it that we're actually going to calculate? Like, what are the kind of projections that we want to ask ourselves? Because models are really an if-then structure. If you do this, then this happens. If you do that, then that happens. So what we, what we did, and you'll see this throughout the, the report, you even saw it already in my results slide that I showed you. 
What we did is to take three different sort of what we call scenarios in this talk. What, but basically what it, what it is is looking at the current measures, in other words, the measures as of summer of 2018, okay, locked into time, and sort of see, project out what those will deliver in terms of emissions reductions. And then we looked at two other scenarios, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the talk. Um, one is called Climate Action Strategies, which is focusing on a set, set of 10 specific strategies that city, states, and businesses can use to reduce emissions and to sort of see if you pulled all those levers, what would happen. And then finally, what we call enhanced engagement, which is sort of additional action on those climate action strategies, but then also adding in lots of other potential levers beyond the 10 uh, strategies. And sort of, there are two different ways to look at what the potential reductions might be from this community or these coalitions of actors. Um, I'm actually going to skip that. I'm really going to skip that. Um, and I want to get us to uh, the current measures. Like I said, I'm happy to go back and talk about analysis if you want. Um, question? Yes? So the enhanced engagement is the federal level engagement? It's the what? The federal level engagement? Oh, uh, no. It's a great question. But we did not do any federal assessment in this study. The study that we released, you know, the study I'm talking about, which was released in September of 2018, um, did not include federal, because the thesis of that paper, that, that report, was what does it all add up to from city, states, and businesses, and what more could they do? Now, stay tuned, because there is another report coming, and that one will include federal re-engagement, because the political moment is different now, right? The, the, you know, we already kind of established the groundwork of like what city, states, and businesses can do, um, people are interested now, looking forward, there is going to be a presidential election in our country in not too long. And, yeah. Maybe. Maybe, but, well, <laughs> okay. Existential question, but yes. Um, and so people are, and, and there, we do have midterm elections that have already happened, and there does seem to be a vector of, of kind of conversation that's moving toward broadening out the conversation on climate, including not, not not least the kind of Green New Deal discussion, which this is not about, but has raised a lot of interest. So this material I'm presenting today is only city, state, and business. And I'll talk a little bit about what I think that means for federal engagement, and then for the, the kind of full result, you'll have to wait till later this year when we release that report. But it's in the works, um, and that's coming. So let's talk about the three different pieces, the current measures, Climate action strategies, enhanced ambition, and I'll try to go through this briefly, but give you a sense of what those things are. So I asserted at the beginning that probably all of you have heard of at least one or more, you know, probably more different kinds of commitments that individual cities or states or businesses or whatever are taking. Um, we talked through why that matters, why I think it's significant, but let's unpack a little bit what those kinds of commitments can look like for those who aren't sort of following this kind of day to day. Um, so, for example, there are things like um, uh, let me see here, current. Oh, this is just this is just the aggregation. So, what, what I've done here is looked at different kind, different categories of commitment, like greenhouse gas, kind of overall greenhouse gas emissions commitments. We look at um, energy policies, like renewable portfolio standards. We looked at energy efficiency policies, zero emissions vehicle, zero emission vehicle mandates, which are something that. Um, these city states and businesses have ability to do, um, sustainable transportation, uh, HFCs, and, um, and fugitive methane. All of those are ways, all of those are ways that um, that these actors, whether city states or businesses, can actually make a difference. And so what I've done here is just shown you a little bit of what our sense of aggregate impact of the current commitments are. This is not the overall emissions impact, right? This is just the sort of specifics. So for example, um, our estimate was that clean energy policies and goals could increase demand for renewable generation to 500 terawatt hours by 2025. Okay, so that's kind of an example of the first step of our analysis, this kind of inner aggregation step, before we feed it into the, the economy-wide model. So that's kind of how that, uh, that particular structure works. Um, um, what do we include in current measures? And so this is actually kind of a, you know, helpful because again, I told you we have this kind of, you know, ragged kind of data. It's all different kinds of actors and it's all different kinds of policies. Um, for example, here's the GHG stuff I just mentioned: renewables, energy demand, transportation, HFCs, oil and gas, and ag, which I didn't 
talked about in the last slide. Um, but the point is, for example, we do include the Reggie caps. We include AB32 from California, for example. Um, but we didn't include city uh, 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 greenhouse gas targets, partly because of data availability challenges and partly because a lot of those were subsumed under state, uh, uh, state targets. So there are some cases in which we didn't, we were not able to include every single policy. Like we tried to reflect as much as possible what we considered to be in aggregate the, the general trend. But when possible, we did err on the side of being somewhat conservative because in some cases we just, when we didn't have enough data, we just had to leave it out because we couldn't obviously make stuff up. So the numbers that I'm giving you, I think should be seen as kind of a reasonable estimate, but a little bit on the conservative side. We were trying to be cautious about not overstating our case, overstating the impact of, uh, of what we wanted to do, or what we wanted to assess. So let me give you three examples of, uh, of what um, this kind of impact of these, uh, of these individual policy clusters would look like. Um, so for example, you know, we looked at the power sector. This is one of the big sectors, as you all know. Um, this is our 500 terawatt hour impact from the power sector, from like additional RPS, or sorry, from existing RPS. What does that actually drive in terms of total amount of, uh, of consumption? Um, mobility, we also looked at. So we, we basically said, look, these, um, you know, additional ZEV requirements could cut annual vehicle miles travel, oh, sorry, would add something like 15% of, uh, drive to 15% of new vehicle sales from current measures. And then similarly, um, sustainable transport networks we thought could cut uh, VMT by something like 36 billion miles compared with the BAU for 2025. So that's kind of on the mobility side for, again, what's already been committed to. And then here's a third example. There's more more stuff in the, in the mix, but this is just an example on methane which turns out to be a, a pretty good thing to look at, it turns out. Um, so something like 17% uh, uh, emissions reduction from methane relative to 2005 levels by 2025 as a result of city, state, and business policy. So that's again, current measures, what's already on the books. What, is, what does this all add up to? Well, here's the, here's the core question, and I'll, 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 I'm gonna kind of build out this waterfall chart for you over the course of the talk. Um, here's our emissions in 2005. This is just emissions. This is not including land sector sinks. Um, just for clarity, um, that was something like 6,500 uh, million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Um, since 2005 down to 2016, the most recent year we had data when we did the study, um, something like a 12% reduction. That is not just because of market forces and the switch to gas. Please remember that. It's not the only thing that drove it down. Okay, that was a big deal, but there are a lot of policies a lot of policy at the federal level, a lot of policies at the state level, a lot of impacts of a long-term and you know sustained investment in R&D by, by by our country and our countries around the world that helped drive that uh, emissions trajectory down. Of course, like I said, I, I work in the White House, so I wouldn't say that. Um, I'm not sure I can't back up, but anyway, um, can't back up. I wanted to show you this one. Um, in absence of other. Um, Policies, we, we did estimate, and this is a rough estimate, so don't read too much into it, but this is a kind of back of the envelope, reasonable estimate that between 2016 and 2025, just driven by economic and population growth, we would probably see something like a 3% increase in emissions between sort of now and 2025. And again, our GDP is gonna grow something like 20% between now and 2025, and you'd expect, absent anything else, there to be some uh, associated emissions increase with that. So we estimated something like 3% incorporating energy efficiency improvements that happen naturally, uh, et cetera. Um, what we, though, found was that with those even current commitments, those would drive down emissions something like 17% below 2005 levels by 2025. So in other words, you know, again, it's, it's a, a little bit of a sort of an up and down thinking here, but but something like this is where we would be with current commitments from city, states, and businesses. This is where we roughly would have been otherwise. Okay, so there is a big kind of impact of what those city, state, and business current commitments are already doing. So they help a lot. They help a tremendous amount. Okay, now let's look at. Oh, let's see what happened. I think I. There we go. Sorry. Reorient the three. Um, so second, so that's what's current commitments. Now we're entering the world of projections. So if you're to cross the, cross the threshold, with me. We're, we're now going from uh, kind of projecting what's currently there to thinking about well, what might be there in terms of 
commitments that can be implemented in the near term in the next couple of years here in the US, and what would those actually then look like? So the first set of actions that we, we, we thought through are a set of actions called these climate action strategies. And plus I get hung up on the term. I, we, it's a term that we use in the report. Um, but basically what we did, and this is where I, I have to say, this study is quite different from a usual, I would call academic study. Because number one, the genesis that I told you was different. But number two, the way we structured the scenarios in the outline is also very different. Because these climate action strategies were not just things that we, as researchers, took out a pen and paper and just sketched out on our own. These were actually developed in consultation with the actors themselves, with city, states, and businesses that were already doing stuff. And we actually tried to say, have a convert, we did, have conversations with many, many groups, both NGOs and actual government people and business people. What are you doing today? Here are some things we think that could have high impact. And what do you think is feasible for you to implement in the next two to three years? So these were co-generated climate action strategies. They were not just researcher-driven climate action strategies. And I think that is one of the institutional strengths of America's Pledge, which is its research, engagement, and communications. They're all three pieces. I'm part of the research side, but it's very important to have all three of those as we're doing this work, because that's how we can speak to the audiences that we really want to speak to and help them also educate us as to what's feasible and what we should sort of look into more in terms of our assessment. So I won't run through all of these. You're welcome to look at them in the report. But let me highlight a few. Um, two of them are power sector. Uh, double down, that's the word we use, double down on real energy targets. Um, accelerate the retirement of coal power. Those are power sector focused strategies. Uh, we have building energy use here in number four. Reduce, reduce methane leaks in cities and reduce methane leaks at the wellhead. Two similar methane oriented strategies, but have, of course, different sort of policy mechanisms to get them to work. Yes? Just a quick clarifier the double down on renewable energy targets, does that mean what, doubling them? No, it's, a, it's, it's, the it's, a, it's kind of a kind of a marketing kind of word. So it's basically like do more on. Okay. okay. Let's just so there's no like. Let's just reframe it as okay. do more on renewable energy targets. Okay, thanks. Double down just means we're going to do more. Okay. <laughs> That's like a. It's like government language, okay. Um, uh, consult the language, maybe. Um, so let me give you an example. Here's one climate action strategy um, that is fits all of our criteria. So it's near term, it's high impact, and it's available to city, states, and businesses today. So in other words, it doesn't require federal government intervention, right? It doesn't require some kind of restructuring of the global capitalist economy. It just is like they can do it right now. And the reason we know they can do it right now is that there are some states that are already doing actually quite interesting work on it. Um, so reducing methane leaks in cities, this is my attempt to show you what methane distribution looks like, which is actually a hard picture to come up with, but basically just you know kind of um, natural gas distribution infrastructure. Um, so for example, you know we, I mean, this is a something like half a million uh, you know, metric tons of CO2 for the leaks from natural gas distribution systems each year globally. It's not US, but that's globally. It's a lot. Um, there's always going to be some leakage, but you can always go from like bad leakage to better leakage, and so that's what kind of we're talking about. Um, for New Jersey's largest utility, P, S, E, and G, which I can never remember what it means, um, use leak data from Google Street View, I love this, equipped with advanced leak detection sensors. Okay, and they were able to find leaks by just driving around with a Google car, and then they were able to tighten them up. They got, a, you know, what they estimate is an 83% reduction in leakage, um, and replaced one third fewer models of pipe than they if they just kind of used the conventional approach. So that's just one example. And again, I'm sure it's not magic; it won't work everywhere in the same way. But it's an example of this kind of near-term, high impact, and available today, because you just need to kind of do it. Um, so we, we kind of did that for all these different climate action strategies, developed it out, and then conversed with the modeling teams of how we implement that in the actual assessment. The net result of that is that by doing the climate action strategies in a set of politically plausible states, by the way, this is not assuming all states do everything, which is not realistic. 
This is essentially taking the states that are already on board and cities that are already on board. We estimate that that could drive us from 17% below 2005 to 21% below 2005. So significant uh, additional action. Uh, and then the final piece is, okay, so those are 10 specific strategies. The reason we formulated those 10 was frankly to provide a platform for further conversations with these actor groups that we're talking to. Uh, we will broadly not meet specifically that we're talking to with this project and provide sort of like, look, here's the ways that we've identified through this conversation that you all can potentially make a big impact fast. And so as these new governors are coming in, you know, Illinois is doing, well, Illinois is doing more. We have a new governor in Wisconsin, Maine, uh, well, so is doing Michigan is doing more in New Mexico. So they've all come in and they're saying like, we want to do more. This provides a way to start those conversations. Here are some things that are near term and high impact that you can do in your state. Okay. Um, the third piece is enhanced engagement, what we call enhanced engagement. That's really the same concept of like, what more could be done, but we expand the boundaries a bit. And by a bit, I mean we expand the boundaries in terms of politically, what states, cities might actually participate. So expanding the tent a little bit, but not again, it's not assuming all red states flip blue. It's saying, what are some states that are a little more on the margin, and how might they be, how might they come in? And then similarly expanding the tent on in terms of the actual policies that could be implemented. So it's not just uh, uh, power sector decarbonization through uh, coal, accelerated coal power plant retirements. It's not just methane leakage. It's, there's a lot of other things that can be done that aren't included in the tent climate action strategies. Um, so I'm gonna, I just said that stuff. So. Um, We'll talk about a few of these. Um, for example, power sector. Um, this is what we uh, kind of show that you know with um, uh, coal retirements. Uh, this is the current measures, and here's the enhanced engagement. So, for example, in 2025, which is a, a time period of interest for us, something like 69 gigawatts of coal power plant retirement in 2025, but increasing that to something like 128 gigawatts by 2025, because okay. coal power is actually uh, something that's easy to actually get rid of in a technical sense. You just turn off the switch. Um, renewables, you have 860 terawatt hours going up to 1,050 terawatt hours, so not quite as dramatic a change in, on the RE side, um, going from current measures to enhanced engagement, but just to give you a sense of the kinds of uh, magnitudes that we're talking about. Um, you, get a, you can see here, you get a sort of, this is current measures on mobility in terms of um, zero, zero emission vehicles on the road. Here's a, uh, climate action strategies, and here's the incremental addition we included from enhanced engagement. That's again primarily from expanding slightly the tent of participants. Um, and here is similar on, on methane reductions, and you see here the current measures, action strategies, and enhanced engagement. And again, expanding participants is the primary driver. Excuse me. Yes, please. Can we go back to the top? Yeah. So, why, why there's a flat yeah. Like this, have, this little king here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, partly that's because our model is on a five-year cycle. So you see, like, don't don't over-resolve. Like on the on the historical stuff, we have actual historical data. On the projections, we don't resolve it that finely. We don't have a year-by-year -year projection. And so what we see here is that these strategies can be implemented soon, and they have an impact soon because you're just turning off the leakage. Right. And then there's some some slight additional deployment in the five-year period to, to, to 2025. It's like it takes time to get the policy implemented and then we see the results. That's part of it, although it's actually for methane, some of it can be done quickly. So that's why you see the kind of rapid change on the enhanced engagement. So we're, we're kind of making some assumptions that more states will do something in the near term as opposed to waiting until later. <laughs> that's why it's more key. Okay. So, Ultimately, so this is the final like piece of the puzzle in terms of the sort of cascading waterfall. With those enhanced engagement strategies, you go then from 21 to 24 percent in our analysis. Now, these are not magic numbers, but this is sort of how we how we framed everything up. So again, the city, states, and business is getting us um, close to, though not to, our uh, Paris NDC. Okay, so let me just add it all up. Let me give you a couple of integrative slides, and then we'll talk about some other dimensions of this study. So here's the kind of full, full comprehensive slide. You've seen this all before. Here's the current measures, um, climate action strategies, enhanced engagement. And here's 
an estimate, and there's lots of ways to do an uncertainty estimate in something like this because there are frankly a lot of uncertainties. But this is our, you know, one of our estimates of roughly the kind of band of uncertainty. You see it's relatively large compared to you know, where we are. So it could theoretically go anywhere between you know, the, of, you know, meeting and exceeding our Paris NDC to frankly probably more likely somewhat you know, less than what, 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 we, uh, what we estimated there. But that's our, our best guess. And then this is the kind of estimate of the gap to the end. <laughs> and this is the kind of thing that, as we think about a federal re-engagement scenario, 2020, post-2020, um, the federal re-engagement has, has, in my mind, two functions. First of all, you obviously need something to fill that gap. Right? So you, you just can't get, under a sort of central assumptions, you just can't get there from here with city, state, and business action alone. And I emphatically told, said this in my testimony the other day. Like, you can't rely on city, states, and businesses to carry it all the way over the finish line. We just can't do it. Now, are we very grateful we have it? Yes, we are. It's really helping a lot, but it can't be the only story. And so that's an important message. The other thing is that I view federal re-engagement as a, as a way to make more likely also that we actually hit these harder, increasingly hard tar targets in some ways, and sort of ambitious goals. Um, you know, uh, these are predicated on some assumptions, and I, you know, we try to be clear about what those assumptions are, but the more federal engagement we have, the more likely we are to be able to get toward that uh, target, and frankly, beyond 2025, this has been very 2025-centric as a, as a presentation, but it does matter, of course, what we do in the longer term, uh, and we don't want to just max out in 2025 and be done. Um, this is just a short, I don't think I'm going to dwell on this, but just to show you, we did some sensitivities on the different pieces of the analysis. I'm happy to talk more about that. That's the root of that, um, that error bar that I showed you in the previous slide. And here's a rough, I guess I didn't use the, well, you, you can see here the rough uncertainty that that we get from each of the scenarios, current measures, climate action strategies, and enhanced engagement. I realize this is too small for you guys to read. Sorry about that, but that's what each of those is. Um, happy to talk more about this. Th this is a, an important slide, okay? They're all, they're all, why would I show you an unimportant slide? I would never. Um, so, uh, so, so this is a, a, a key point, though, to remember, which is that I, I think of this study, this, this result in two ways. So first of all, this is by sector. Let me let me show you. This is the same waterfall, in a way, but it's, <laughs> it's 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 a different sort. Of, it's a sectoral slice versus a scenario slice. And so what you see here is, here's um, the reduction that we need to meet the Paris NDC. This is a power sector contribution, and that's current measures and uh, climate action and enhanced engagement, right? The three. So here's what you get in the power sector from each of those. Um, what do we have next? That includes both coal and renewables, building an industry transport, HFCs, oil and gla gas and landfill methane, natural lands and ag and other, and this is the gap to the NDC. I know the text is small, I'm sorry about that. But what you see here cuts one thing that's really big, which is power sector, okay? Now, who's surprised by that? Nobody's surprised by that. Nobody here is surprised by that. Power sector is the big kahuna in terms of near-term, high-impact emissions reductions in the United States. That's a lesson we know already. But this is confirming it, right? So I'm not presenting this as a new result, but a result we have to be aware of, which is that this is where a lot of the juicy reductions are in the near term. We have to remember that in terms of policies. And frankly, a lot of that is accelerated coal power retirements. The other part of the story, though, is that you do need to do everything, right? Each of these things does contribute, and each of these things does have an impact in terms of whether we can get close or to our, our target. And so that's another lesson that in the generic sense is not surprising, but in the specific sense I think it's quite interesting to see how these all do add up to get us close to that target and how it really demonstrates that a kind of comprehensive strategy, even at the state or city level, is something that's really important for any leaders and legislatures to be doing because you can't really get there if you're only focusing on one of those pieces. Okay, so that wraps up my kind of US focus piece. Now I have like one slide on the international. So we're at the School of Advanced International Studies. I'm well aware of that. Um, so let's talk a bit, and I think this is where it could be interesting for our conversation, about why I think this is kind of an essential part of raising global ambition. And as I mentioned at the front end, you know, the UN Secretary General is holding this big summit this year in September, um, which the logo I copied and pasted there. 
which is all they've got right now, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see what we'll see how it shapes up. But basically, you know, okay, a race we can win. I, I agree that I agree with that. I think we can. I think we can win. It's going to be tough, but I think we can do it. Um, the point is that this is going to happen in September. This is sort of the launching point for what we all know to be part of the essential part of Paris. And the essential part of Paris is, of course, a pledge and review structure that requires countries to assess and scope their opportunities for action, and then to implement them and report on them, basically. There's a lot of other stuff, but that's basic. And one of the dimensions of Paris that people have really, frankly, not fully figured out is that there's also a kind of this generic invocation to include all parts of society. Like, everybody's part of this. Okay, yes, they are. We have all these international processes to acknowledge and, and pull those actors in. It's this sub-national piece that I think is going to be an essential part of this next sort of two to three year phase of raising national ambition. It's not sufficient. It's not the only piece that countries have to look at. But if we think about what's helpful about sub-national action, look, the US we're a federal system, we have more of a kind of obvious set of policy levers that are happening at different levels, but a lot of other countries have different kinds of sub-national action that are possible. Think about the, the difference between a kind of national assessment of scoping of potential and a national target that's done at the national level only, and then one that's done in conjunction with the national level and their subnational actors, all kind of thinking about what they can do in delivery. The latter one, I will assert, this is not a proven hypothesis, but this is a, an assertion based on some of this work. The latter is the one that is going to be A, more robust. I also believe it will be more ambitious because the different city states and businesses will have scoped and understood more of what they might be able to do based on kind of real input and real analysis. And the countries will be more confident about their ability to deliver on it because there's actually kind of some political buy-in from the different entities that exist within the country that will be an essential part of implementing that target. Now, I say this with some experience having done the US NDC in the United States, which was very much a federal driven target generation process. I still think it was good. It was still ambitious and achievable. And it was a lot of, you know, I'm happy to talk about that. But ultimately, this broader engagement that entrains in, in, in the subnational actors will be an essential part of how we actually raise ambition and then deliver on it. And so the question is, how do we think about new models of collaboration? I think America's Pledge gives us one model, which is a kind of subnationally driven model of scoping and raising ambition. But I think there are other models that are out there um, in other countries, and I'm very quite interested in sort of understanding more what, what's going on in other countries. I think there's a lot of interesting places right now. Uh, Brazil, which is probably more similar to kind of US in some ways. I think um, China's uh, a very interesting kind of implementation question of how the subnational and provincial actors kind of link in with the, the, the national policy making. Um, uh, Australia is in a particularly kind of moment right now where, where I think some national action could make a relatively big difference. Um, I think Korea is an interesting case. Um, I think Japan is an interesting case. And there is already actually some work we're doing with America's Pledge in Japan, uh, the Japan Climate Initiative, which is the kind of analog that's uh, a kind of experiment that, that we'll be seeing how, how that plays out. So I think that's particularly interesting. Um, and I, I think we could potentially talk about that um, in the conversation. I want to acknowledge um, it wasn't just the authors that I put up before. It's a lot of people, which I won't list through here, uh, but you can read. A um, number of individual people, experts in the field, as well as uh, well, experts in the field who either read the report or gave us feedback in other ways. Um, so thanks to them. Um, the state of California and Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, were, were um, kind of helpful in terms of sort of guiding this overall America's pledge process and, of course, funding I mentioned before uh, with Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, I want to and with one, because we might as well, and it's fun, most, I mean, there's, there's a, there's, there's a um, documentary that, uh, that um, 
we, we help support in a very minor way, so, so I'm not really claiming any credit for this, but like this was part of this whole America's Pledge uh, sort of juggernaut. And this got released, um, um, I, I guess at the COP in, in December of 2018. We actually had the mayor of Pittsburgh, and I got to introduce him, because the documentary is called Pittsburgh, or so Paris to Pittsburgh. Because you remember when Donald Trump pulled out, or announced his intent, well, we're still in the Paris Agreement, by the way, until four days after the US, the 2020 election. So, um, um, the, the, uh, in, the, in that speech, Donald Trump said, oh, you know, I'm the, I always like to be the mayor of Pittsburgh, not Paris. And then, of course, the mayor of Pittsburgh's like totally climate guy, and he's like, I totally disagree with this. So he came and helped launch this at, at the COP. Um, so let's just watch. This is a two-minute trailer. We get essentially the full thesis of the hour and a half documentary, which you're, by the way, quite welcome to watch uh, on your own time, but I won't make you watch an hour and a half right now. <laughs> um, let's see. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. I was elected to represent yeah. the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. Pittsburgh? Now, what was upsetting about that? That alliteration was a stereotype of our past. But Pittsburgh is poised and ready to lead in the 21st century. We're seeing cities and states and companies and individuals saying we are still in, even with the president pulling us out of one of the most important treaties when every other major country in the world has said we are going to come together and commit to dealing with climate change. I continue to be shocked at how close the water is encroaching just on the beach. Sea level rise is completely apparent in Miami. We had six and a half foot of water on the main level of the house for over a week. Stuff that was in our bedroom wound up in the garage, and stuff that was in the garage, I imagine that's way down in Louisiana now. The storms are becoming stronger in Puerto Rico. The worst thing is to think that that reality will repeat. Not a lot survived that fire in Ventura County. It burned so hot that everything just liquefied. To not be able to save anything it was just really hard. If we're going to avoid breaching catastrophic levels of warming, we need to be putting our foot on the renewable energy acceleration pedal. The transformation towards a renewable energy future is the greatest economic opportunity of the 21st century. Businesses have lined up to say we're still committing to the Paris Accord because it's good for their bottom line. My daughter Faye, she made the decision that wind was where she wanted to be. This is an opportunity that hasn't been available in America for a long, long time. The solar industry is offering that second chance opportunity to individuals like myself. It doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, you have a role to play here. And if we look at it as an American Marshall Plan, we can exceed the goals of the Paris Agreement. This is the start of us taking control of our future. We have the right to a future. We have the right to these basic necessities that we need to live. We need people who need to take action. Our lives are at stake here. And that's it. So let's maybe go to questions and answers. So um, I want to open with a question about the role of the federal government. You said that you think that uh, the federal government could, in some sense, facilitate or enable these subnational uh, actions and make them more effective. Can you elaborate a bit on yeah. what do you think are the most important things that the federal government could do? I mean, there's a two. That's a two-part question, and actually, in the testimony the other day, they, there was a very explicit set of questions about what can the federal government do today with the current structure of political structure of the federal government. In other words, with a well, let's leave it at that. With the current structure of the, the federal government in both the House, the Senate, and the presidency, and then there's a question of, you know, what could a post 2020 election federal government do most usefully. And by the way, I do not assume in any way, or I do not want to assume that 
this is a one party is issue, right? Like that there theoretically we are seeing, and even in the testimony the other day, you know, there is genuine, uh, Donald Trump aside, there's some genuine bipartisan interest in the topic. We'll see what that translates to. But um, ultimately in the medium to long term, this must be a, a full multi-party or bipartisan kind of engagement, right? It doesn't mean that we only do what the current bipartisan consensus is today, but that in the end, this has to be something that includes legislative solutions that are significant, they're thoroughgoing, and the kind of rapid transition that we know we need to do to be on anything like a one and a half C pace with something like minus 80% on coal by, 20, by 2030 um, has to be thoroughgoing and it has to be politically grounded in, frankly, a legislative process as well. So the two parts of that question, either the two sort of framings of that question I would give is what can we do in the very near term? on the federal side, and the answer is not all that much. Um, but certainly things like the Congress has, in fact, allocated funds to do things like weatherization, efficiency, that the administration's not spending out, so they should do that, right? The, you know, the, they should spend out the money that's been given to them on, on stuff like that. Um, and then there's also, you know, kind of the a very important point of not getting in the way of city, states, and businesses that actually want to do more. And the, the cardinal example of this is California, which has historically had an exemption to do more on its own state regulatory drivers on, for example, vehicle fuel economy. Um, and that, you know, preserving those sort of abilities to go faster and, and further than the federal government would be an important step. Now, once you turn the page and say, okay, well, if we can, frankly, and I, I hope this is the case, that if more broadly, uh, support is there in 2020 both on both parties for, for doing more um, uh, uh, sort of comprehensive American approach. It has to be uh, a multi-part strategy, um, ranging on the one hand, you've, I mean, many of you have heard of the Green New Deal, which is a very comprehensive and sort of like all in, like every single policy is sort of related to climate change. Let's leave that off to the side for the moment because there's a lot of stuff to talk about on that idea, but the point of a, a pervasive, all-encompassing economic transition is what we have to be starting with. The Green New Deal recognizes that, and it sort of engages with it in a certain specific set of policy suggestions. That might not be the set of suggestions we want to do, but ultimately it has to be comprehensive. It can't be just a carbon pricing policy. It might be include a carbon pricing strategy, but it also has to include things like infrastructure, very fundamentally and other kinds of policies. Um, you know, when we were doing Obama stuff, you know, we have some existing policy levers and probably those will remain uh, good policy levers like vehicle fuel economy standards. And so it really is kind of a, everything you can invoke on the federal side really would have to be part of that discussion. Let me end it there. Yeah. Do you want to field your own questions or should I? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, whatever. Okay. Okay. Thank it's fine. So, um, I have two uh, points you know, somewhat connected. I don't know if you remember uh, before Brown, um, we had the governor. I do remember. I, yeah. did this I was actually in graduate school, I think, when he was elected, so yeah. So he did these three uh, global summits. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, in a sense, he was a pioneer in state to state agreements. I think that two of them. And I think the question, which is connected to the other side, is why was this guy, you know, a smart bodybuilder, basically, uh, able to pull this off? And, you know, his, his model was very simple. He said, it. he said, you know, in the 70s, we had this movie, Saturday Night uh, Fever, and everybody was going to dispose, and there were this. Why can't we do this for environment? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so actually, this when you say culture, I think uh, uh, most of this stuff is not. I mean, you can always hire the technicians to do that, but it's the culture part that is missing. Because basically, and I think <laughs> this is this is why he was so important in this. Because. Uh, the, the, the answer to the big questions we have cannot come from the existing systems. Mainly we have a, a diplo diplomatic system that is obsolete, 
and this is also why this is interesting. See, any uh, untraditional approach to uh, diplomacy would be a huge step forward. Uh, the other one is the higher education system, which is fundamentally obsolete. And all these intellectual ghettos and how these people just, it has made thinking, it, it certainly has eviscerated imagination, <coughs> but it, I think in some ways it has also made thinking it possible. So, yes, on both of those, by the way. So, so um, but, but there's a lot of good stuff there. Let me um, say, uh, by the way, you know, I, I love the idea that if we can all learn disco, why can't we solve climate change? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's actually, uh, in, fact, so obvious. In, fact, I, in fact, I have to say, I kind of agree with that. Um, I think, you know, I think we can do this, and it's, I don't think it's going to be in some ways as hard as we tell ourselves. In other ways, it will be harder, but it, the ways it's not as hard is I, I just, I do think that your mental models, your kind of the, the kind of the way we bind ourselves with mental models is the thing that I think is, is problematic there. And I, I this links to your, your your question. I had somebody I presented this at Climate Week in, in New York in September, a version of this, and um, somebody in the audience stood up and was an artist and he said, Well, where's the role of art in this? Like where's the role of culture in this? And I have to say, I completely agree. Um, I kind of present to you as a kind of expert, you know professor, that kind of thing, and that's my job and that's what I do. But I also think that this is a really important point, that this kind of pervasive, all-encompassing, massive energy transition that we know we need to undertake in the next 10 to 20 years will require us to rethink how we do things and will require the engagement from different kinds of, uh, different kinds of people and frankly a lot broader set of engagement than we've done historically, which as you, as you might know in the climate world is not particularly like intellectually or otherwise diverse. And so, um, you know, it has to be all of society. So the, the point there is that that's a really important thing. In fact, that is why I showed you the, the trailer, is because of that guy's question, because I, I want to kind of make sure that we're sort of trying to tell the messages in different ways. And I, even though we're doing this in a university context, in a classroom or a seminar room, I still want us to be kind of aware of that. And I frankly welcome and, and encourage all kinds of diverse creative thinking. Um, the final piece I'd say is I totally agree. Look, I'm a university professor. Many of us in the room are. I love my people, but you know, I, you know, I love our institutions, and we do some things very well, which is to produce sort of incremental contributions to the field, and that's important. It's important for people going for tenure and all that stuff. So keep doing that. But um, but as institutions, I I would agree we're not as good as thinking in an integrative way, and I think that that's one of the things I was without explaining it, alluding to when I said, we have to organize ourselves different, we have to use different institutional models of how we engage with each other if we're gonna really solve this problem. So creative thinking on that front is, is quite well. How about uh, there and then here and then there? Okay. Uh, so this is more of a, moving away from the report and more on your opinion. With you touched on the Green New Deal and all that. Do you think uh, the that those kinds of approaches are over politicizing things, or you know, because you know you're taking a character at this point, AOC, yep. and turning it into. I, I'm wondering. I, I heard from folks before. I mean, this was before my time that if Al Gore hadn't released, you know, that documentary, then it wouldn't have become a politicized thing, and maybe it wouldn't have been mm -hmm. cast like that. Uh, do you would you agree with that assessment? Do you think a different approach is needed, uh, or does it not make any impact? Uh. This is more going with your yeah. gut rather than No, no, I, I have I have opinions about this, um, but they are opinions, so be aware. Um, this is a political issue, and people. Ha I mean, we have to we have to say what we think, and I think that if if the if the transition is going to require a kind of thoroughgoing, deep transition of our economy. Um, we have to say what we think is going to be necessary, and we have to provide you know, ideas of how that could happen. And I think those two things together are what is good about the Green New Deal. That there's a recognition of this, the, frankly, the, the scale, the staggering and near-term scale of the challenge that we're up against. And there is an idea of how it could be addressed. It doesn't mean that everybody thinks the idea is good, 
or that it's the right sort of set of tools to bring to bear on that problem. But I commend both AOC and the other people who've worked on Green New Deal ideas over the past like year-ish or so um, for flagging it and, and being thinking big about it, because we do have to think big about it. And I do not think that sort of falling back onto the kind of, uh, you know, for example, there's a there's a there's a danger to implicit in the question that you said, which is not I know what you were suggesting, but the danger is we self censor ourselves because we only think certain things are politically feasible. Now, obviously, at some point, we have to be tactical about what can be accomplished in the next one year or whatever. But you know, at some point, you got to say what you say what you think, and you got to do what's the, the right thing. And and um, we in this country, there have been times when things can transform quickly. And I think we could well be, you know, I don't want to be sanguine or naive about this, but we, you know, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen in a cascading, rapidly transforming way. And we have to remember that we have to keep sort of working creatively on how that, that transition could happen, what the policy kind of concept is, and, you know, be pressuring all of our institutions to do that stuff. So let me leave it at that. Otherwise, I'll just rambling. Uh, I think we had. Okay. I'll ask an easy question, not about politics. So I know you focus on the national aggregate and the cell for the talk today, which is already very interesting, but I'm just curious if you or your colleague have looked into the details of the city level and state level results and see if it can provide information for us to form new form of um, alliances or coalition. For example, if there are states or cities that the lowest hanging fruits are methane regulation or vehicle regulation. I wonder if those information would be useful for the future. Yeah. So um, we have thought about that. <clears throat> and one of the things that um, uh, both America's Pledge and We Are Still In and like US Climate Alliance and others are looking at doing now, again, this is the question of what's the near-term tactics on this bigger, bigger problem, is doing kind of exactly that, which is a great thought, which is how do you see what our results are? And I use the term kind of very quickly in an, in an early slide or an early note that I made about scoping ambition. And the question is what, I, I do think that this is an important point, like again, I worked in government, I worked in sort of US context for the NDC. I also worked with other countries as we were doing our bilateral discussions as other countries were generating NDC, so that's notably China for the US joint announcement with China, India, Brazil, Korea, Mexico, others. And it is my strongly held view on this that um, the, the governments are inherently a bit conservative, right? They, they don't want to promise stuff that they don't really see a path to deliver on. And frankly, that's kind of as it should be because they're answerable to their voters. That's kind of how we ought to have it. But as people who, some of us in this world, like often, frankly, things are more possible than might seem because the world of, for example, clean energy is changing very rapidly and people's kind of views that might have been formulated 10 years ago about the relative costs of fossil versus renewables, for those who've been tracking, like it's completely upended right now. Everything's completely different. We're in the middle of a you know, techn technology cost revolution. So a lot of those old mental models just aren't correct anymore. And so working with the cities and states um, in using a new model structure, which is again, sort of putting the analytical communities in closer contact with the uh, policy making communities is part of what we're trying to build out. But I think it's not just our ideas, lots of other people working on this idea. And I can see that whether it's in a city, state, or business, or a US federal, or your own country context, wherever you might be from, all that stuff is, is I think, really important for us to be doing. Is that your question? Okay. Sometimes I get off on different tracks. So Sarah. So I was going to ask a question, but then I, I, and I do have one, but I wanted to open up to say students instead, if there are any, because I know I, there's a couple of students in my class. Are there any other students that want to ask a question before I do? No? Okay, um, and, and hopefully, and feel free to think of one in the meantime. Uh, so, because I know we have a couple of US students who have written on uh, papers for my class on similar topics. So, um, what I'm interested in as I saw this, and perhaps it's not unrelated to the two previous questions, um, is, okay, so you've done this really neat scenario work, and some of it shows that despite, you know, the, the, uh, the federal leadership void in climate that we have right now, uh, that we can reach some uh, some levels of reduction. So now that you've done all this work, uh, how much do you think is possible 
what do we have to do to get there? Because clearly it's not just gonna be like, oh, greater engagement, it's just gonna happen on its own. Uh, so what do you kind of see as the most important things that students or professionals in this room might be interested in and for us to think about a bit more broadly in terms of actually pushing towards uh, greater reductions, especially in a time like this when we had the AIA talking about emissions of growth again? Yeah, yeah. Um, so good question, and I, I always like to kind of remind people that um, yes, it is important to um, look at your own life and think about yes, installing that um, you know, automated thermostat and you know thinking about your vehicle transportation and doing all those things that we know we ought to be thinking about uh, in terms of individual choices that are more environmentally compliant. So do that, but like let's just all do that. Like period. Like we just got it. That's done. Like we got to do all that. Next, though, is the question that I think is called by FCC one and a half, which is that you can't just do it on consumer choice, and that includes in the United States, where there's a lot of reliance, like a lot of like, oh well, just if people chose this or that, then you know, that's we can't just rely on consumer choice, right, at this point, which is I know not what you were stating, but it, the point there is that you have to you have to actually get your organizations, all of your organizations kind of focused on this and leveraged on it. So whether you're in a city, you're also in a state, you're also might be, some people not in this room, maybe businesses, um, communities of faith, all the ones I mentioned, cultural institutions, those all organizations, they have more power than us individually, right? Like let's be blunt, right? Like they have more authority to do stuff than we do individually. So you gotta get them to do stuff. So a lot of this is just constituent engagement, but Frankly, some of us also have, you know, other kinds of ways we can integrate with that or, or kind of work with those organizations. And maybe it's as an outside expert. Maybe it's as somebody who uh, is students who might even be in going into some of these organizations, right? And um, working that strategy and remembering that the organizations have to do more. Whatever they can do, they should be doing is kind of the upshot of that. Um, so that's kind of a non-answer in some ways, but. So everything they can be doing, and then specifically, maybe I'll try to actually answer it. Um, engagement is necessary, but like again, the question is like, what is your angle on it? And I think that some of us will have easier angles than others in terms of that, you know. And I just think realistically that's the case. But um, it is kind of important to just kind of, frankly, meditate a little bit on what what is it that I can do with the groups that I have contact with right now, and how might I, you know, if you're really interested in it, how might I, you know, tweak my Sort of career trajectory or kind of how might I want to be sort of making a difference in this area over the next five or seven years and think about you know ways that you could then contribute more directly um, is that what you were asking yeah absolutely and uh, you know and just to I, I, you know again I don't think it's necessarily completely decoupled from the previous questions about disco and art and yeah, you know, not saying sure I think everyone should go out and have a disco party but <laughs> the, point, the point is that you know a lot of this you know it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be this huge economic crash I do think we face a challenge uh, that you know there still is lots of cheap coal but thankfully there has been some traction but we right now are in a different you know federal space particularly you know here in DC. So because of that, you know, there is that, uh, we don't, we just don't have that leadership. So I think it, you know, can sometimes feel disenfranchising. So to keep in mind that really a lot of this, you know, comes from within organizations. Even in Alberta, climate change legislation, climate policy is legislated, even if it, if it is on an intensity basis. So that says something about that industry. Some people in that industry, right? So, um, so regardless of what organization you go into, I think that's a, a good message. And thank you, that's, I totally agree. And um, just to kind of incrementally build on that, you know, I talked to very, in very generic and vague terms about city, state, and business action, but I think it's worth actually going and taking a look at, and maybe I should put this in for future versions of my talk, but like even just literally in the last couple of weeks, you know, we have seen a lot of states in particular, kind of, and frankly also a couple of cities and businesses on the RE100 commitments, like, you know, states going big on renewable energy targets even in the last couple of months after the midterms right new states going big on renewable energy targets and that's to sarah's point about yeah it kind of you know here it's not there's not a lot happening like today and yes there's you know the house committees and things are starting to ramp up and i really frankly liked the, the vibe of that the hearing that i was at a couple of days ago um it was quite good actually it was quite good it was surprising now don't don't be sanguine, right? Like, I mean, I, I, I've been in the 
political sphere for a while. Like, don't be too, <laughs> like there can be a lot of nice words, not anything that happens. So be always aware, but on the other hand, um, the action is happening, the leadership is there in a lot of parts of the country right now. And that's where the action is today. That's where things are happening. That's where new models are being pioneered. Um, you know, and again, if you all have connections back home, you know, somehow, in some way, uh, that's a way to, to work the strategy also. I'm so sorry, I was a few minutes late, and I might have, you may have addressed this, but um, I'm like always a silver lining kind of person, and so as I, as you know, 2016 unrolled, and there was so much like anguish with the void of federal leadership, um, and then we started to see this subnational action that was so heartening, right? Um, and so it really seems like if, if we could like play out some alternative history or something, and we were in a different state today, um, getting to this idea of broader engagement and more robust engagement, in some ways it feels like the lack of federal leadership has really garnered that greater subnational engagement. Um, and so, I don't know, I, I guess my question is sort of like, what was surprising to you to see kind of how the last couple years have rolled out? And do you see, like, are we achieving some things that we may not have had there actually been stronger federal leadership? So it's interesting, because I was talking to, to Brad Bloomer, who's a New York Times reporter, and he asked me exactly the same question, yeah. right? Like, so, so it's a, it's a it, you know, in other words, is, you know, it, how do we how do we understand what has happened in light of you know should we be, should we be thankful to Donald Trump? That's kind of what it boils down to. And my answer is no. Uh, but 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 because ultimately this was still a, a, uh, a negative outcome in terms of climate policy. I think we have to be aware of that. We have to be kind of clear-eyed about it. Um, and it was on you know very clearly it's had detrimental negative consequences on our kind of overall national engagement and as well as our ability to hit near-term targets as well as therefore other countries around the world commitment to doing the same level of ambition as the US does which is an important part of our global leadership in uh, in, in driving down you know uh, our emissions that other countries kind of mark to that level of ambition part of the audience by the way for America's pledge in fact the original concept of it was to make sure that other countries were aware that stuff was still happening. Which, by the way, many countries, it, 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 I have to say, even working you know, in, on our kind of international stuff, there remains a lot of confusion about how the US federal system works, right? Like, and the idea that sort of states could be doing anything for many countries, and they're not, it's not like people are not smart. It's just that the, the system is very confusing from the outside. Some people are nodding. <laughs> like, so it's very confusing, and it's very unclear what does it all add up to. And that's that was actually the genesis for doing this project. Like I helped write the, the biennial report, which is our biennial sort of report to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And the this America's Pledge team was really interested in having this serve as a kind of again, not officially, but sort of a comprehensive and robust version of where is the US emissions trajectory going. US is not doing that at the federal level, doing that reporting. So um, one of the original ideas was that you know we would tell that story to the world of that there is still action happening, and frankly, there is. So like, I think that that's a good story to tell, and that, that's been sort of seeping through the international kind of ether in some ways. I think it's sort of that, that message is now getting across in a way that it wasn't when we first started this, which was like roughly late 2017 sort of telling, because there was a sense that you know Trump came through a switch and everything turned off, right? Like, and nothing was gonna happen. And that is not true, right? That is not true at all. So it's important for us to remember that that still was a negative thing, but to your point, I do think, and this is the key part of this, that the deep and rapid engagement we've seen of the, over the last couple of years, which frankly was not unrelated to Donald Trump and his decision is something that we had to do anyway. Like it had all of this stuff has to happen anyway. It is my hope. Again, I don't want to be naive or sanguine. It is my hope that this tremendous amount of subnational, non-federal engagement that we've seen will actually make it more possible to do 
even more federal action in the near term, right? Like than otherwise we might have. I think it will improve the politics of federal action. I think it will improve the technical ability of federal action to come in and layer on additional reductions to what, what's already been committed to. I mean, look at how the Clean Power Plan was generated. It was about additional reductions on what's already been done. And so if we're doing more now, you can layer on more from federal. And so it is my, my, my strong assertion that this stuff had to happen. I do believe it has to happen in all countries in order for us to, to solve this problem. And so in that sense, I think it's actually uh, a really good thing that this is going on right now. Yeah, I mean, just a quick add-on. Part of the reason that I thought about this is I'm originally from Montana, uh -huh. a place where there's a lot of anti-federal sentiment, yeah. and people definitely don't like to be told what to do. But if it's a local idea, have Montana do it, right? Energy, yeah. like, That's people are all about it, so. and we can do it in this country if it is grounded in, you know, actions that people believe are. It's like a mini version of the NDC idea, right? That it's all countries making the commitment about what their country wants to do, but. As a country, we have to rely here in particular, but in a lot of places, on what the individual actors that make up that country are willing to do. And not just in a sense that we voted for this representative, but these are the entities committing to 100% And now we need to come back. And now we need to come back. <laughs> I hope that we write that script in five years, that this is the story and how we did it. But, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks so much, Thanks, everybody. everybody.